Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's drama talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. Now we've been doing our themes of picking a favorite sutra and talking about some aspect of that sutra. So I have indeed uh, made an incredibly radical choice and and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Diamond Sutra, which I know nobody's ever heard of before. And I'll be cross-referencing it a little bit. So here's my take on the Diamond Sutra. Uh, it's one take on one aspect of it, which, you know, others may challenge successfully. Um, but the way I have looked at it is that there are two big themes in the Diamond Sutra. And that is leaving aside the recurrent theme of the amazingly great degree of merit that will be accrued by anyone who studies and understands and expounds even three or four lines of the sutra. I think it may have to be a four line minimum. Um, and which is sort of a sub theme that advertises the sutra while you're reading it and uh, hopefully will attract others to study it. Um, so I consider that kind of like a side theme, although it's probably not. That's probably also an important theme. But the two big themes that really stand out to me that I think are very substantial uh, are threaded throughout the uh, entire sutra. The most popular of these two themes, which I think people have uh, thought about and talked about quite a bit, is this theme of name and form. Uh, where the names that we give to things do not actually refer to real or encapsulate real objects. And we shouldn't think of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and living beings in particular, the big three, as being actual references, but just saying that when we say the word Bodhisattva, it's not referring to a real thing that is a static Bodhisattva floating around in space somewhere. And along with... Uh, Along with this idea is, and the way in which it's often applied, is that if someone is aspiring to be a bodhisattva, or if one has already been pronounced a bodhisattva, um, and in a sense, all of us who are practicing are aspiring uh, or practicing bodhisattvas, that we're not supposed to think of ourselves as bodhisattvas, because then we're stuck in a conceptual realm of thinking of ourselves a certain way. And that leads to a sense of entity, of being a self. You know, I am this person who is a bodhisattva. I have this great label and I've got this title and definition. And so I can think of myself that way. So a lot in the Diamond Sutra is urging people not to do that. And, you know, you may be taking the actions of a bodhisattva. You may be satisfying the vows of a bodhisattva to the greatest degree possible. But you don't think of yourself as being that because then you're constraining yourself to this conceptual static idea of what that is. So there are ways of referring to things in the language of name and form, and it's necessary to refer to things, but they don't contain or define the actuality of what they refer to. Not only should we not think of ourselves as bodhisattvas, but when we vow to save all beings, we have this radical statement in the Diamond Sutra that we should not think of the beings that are referred to or that we are attempting to help as actually being living beings. So that's a fairly uh, wild idea that's kind of hard to grasp. Um, but again, if you think, oh, I'm going to save this living being, then you are constraining or confining them to a particular label or a particular static idea, and it doesn't really encapsulate the actuality of beings. Um, so we, we want to go beyond those labels and deal with the... Uh, experience of the actuality of the way things really are, and also not think of them as separate entities. Like there's beings over here and bodhisattvas over here, and we're trying to save them or they're trying to save us, um, whichever end the bodhisattva label is on. So part of the application of that theme is that we attempt to be compassionate, uh, express generosity, uh, in a selfless way and in a sense in a thoughtless way without giving a thought of, oh, I'm, I'm 
doing so good by making this contribution, aren't I great? Or gaining merit, how much merit am I going to get for that? As uh, Bodhidharma uh, said to the uh, to the emperor of Wu, he said, no merit, <laughs> you're not getting anything. <laughs> and the and emperor Wu was very upset. He wanted to get some merit. So, um, so we're training ourselves as non-labeled, non-bodhisattvas to also, you know, be very happy with not with non-merit or no merit, and to just do these things as spontaneous expression of our true nature, without a thought of result or reward. Now, that's a very popular theme, and it's a really a great theme because it leads to hopefully to people um, when they contribute, you know, to to a temple or they contribute to a cause or they contribute to something, whether it's their time or their energy or their, uh, or their thoughts or their, their sitting or their, or their money that they're not doing. So to think of themselves as being generous or to gain merit or to have some result or reward or like, I don't, I, I want to see, you know, uh, am I getting my money's worth? Um, but we do it as a, as a pure and spontaneous expression. Um, but along with this theme uh, is the sub theme, I sub in the sense of under it, as I see it, that leads to or supports this theme. Um, and that's the one that I consider to be more basic. Um, and that other big theme in the Diamond Sutra, which I think is foundational for this a uh, theme of not thinking of yourself this way or that way and not thinking of beings this way or that way touches on the nature of the mind that is able to go beyond such conceptions. And it's the one that um, that really interests me uh, a lot and that I'd like to focus on and that I have thought about quite a bit. Um, so this foundational theme of the Diamond Sutra this other theme, other major theme, both leads to awakening and is, in a sense, the definition of awakening. So it may be seen as both a practice and a reality, since most of us are not uh, perfect from the very beginning. We have a little work to do. And yet it's already a reality. So uh, this is the theme in the Diamond Sutra that has been heavily advertised by Sixth Patriarch Queen Eng, and it is the theme in the Diamond Sutra that led to Sixth Patriarch Queen Eng's initial awakening while selling wood in the marketplace, and then to his later complete awakening while receiving transmission from Fifth Patriarch Hung Yen. And so I'm going to start by referring to how the Diamond Sutra is referenced in the Platform Sutra of Hui Neng. I think it's rather rare to have an exposition called a sutra, which was not a record of the Buddha's, uh, you know, initial actual teachings, his own uh, many lessons in both uh, Theravada and Mahayana. So Hui Neng, as far as I know, is the only one who had his talk uh, titled a sutra. And it's called the Platform Sutra and it's given quite a bit of importance in the Zen literature. It's also rare in that sense to have a sutra that refers to another sutra, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so uh, what's great about that also is that you get a, a look at how a great Zen sage, Hui Neng, leaving aside whether he really existed or not, um, regarded the Diamond Sutra and how he accessed its awakening power. So in a sense, you have a sutra, which is also a commentary on the Diamond Sutra, at least in part. So I'll start with a couple of those references from the Platform Sutra, which I think are very telling uh, regarding the Diamond Sutra. And then I'll review with you some of the sections of the Diamond Sutra that pertain to this theme of how to access one's own awakened mind and how the awakened mind is defined in the Diamond Sutra. Since the Diamond Sutra intersperses its themes with each other throughout the Sutra, uh, it can get a little hard to get a handle on the individual themes that are being developed there, as the exposition of any one of them is developed throughout the Sutra, but also interrupted by references to the other themes. 
I think it's pretty interesting to take some of the sections that just deal with this one theme of the awakened or unattached mind and take a look at them together without the other themes popping up to distract from. So there are three sections in which the platform sutra refers to the diamond sutra. Uh, two of them in, in a little bit of detail, which is to me really fascinating detail. Uh, the first one is just Hui Neng's initial awakening in the marketplace, which is a great story. And there he just says that his mind uh, was awakened when he heard the sutra being recited, which is kind of a cool idea that his mind was ripe for awakening. And when he heard this particular part of the Diamond Sutra uh, being recited, it just hit him. Um, and he doesn't refer there to what in the Diamond Sutra awakened him, but we get a little more specific in the later references. The second reference is when Hung Yen, the fifth patriarch, addresses not Hui Neng, but his address to the, his lecture to the senior monk Shen Shui, Shen Xu, Shen Xiu, thank you, uh, regarding his famous poem that he wrote on the wall, expressing uh, his hope, hopeful enlightenment. And Hung Yen informs him that he has not yet gone through the door of enlightenment. So here's that one as translated by Wang Mulam in 1930 and still my favorite translation. I think there are a couple of people around here who like it too. Yeah. Um, so this little section of, of Hung Yen addressing Shen Xiu. To attain supreme enlightenment, one must be able to know spontaneously one's own nature or essence of mind which is neither created nor can it be annihilated. And here's my favorite uh, a sentence, which also, it's not directly referring to the Diamond Sutra, but it, you'll see that it echoes the Diamond Sutra in the next quote. From Ksana to Ksana, K-S-A-N-A, -A, which is a technical term in Buddhism, which means thought moment to thought moment. I, I can't tell you how much I love this sentence. From ksana to ksana, from thought moment to thought moment, one should be able to realize the essence of mind all the time. Then all things will be free from restraint or emancipated. Once suchness is known, one will be free from delusion forever. And in all circumstances, one's mind will be in a state of thusness. Such a state of mind is absolute truth. If you can see things in such a frame of mind, you will have known the essence of mind, which is supreme enlightenment. Now, where, when he says from thought moment to thought moment, one should be able to realize the essence of mind all the time. He's not directly quoting the Diamond Sutra, but he's echoing it. And you'll see how it's echoed in the next quote. And this is when Hui Neng received transmission from Hung Yen and became the sixth patriarch in the dark of night. Because just like today, there are people running around the Sangha who want to beat other people up if, if they don't think the right people are getting elevated to various positions. So Hui Neng had a hideout from the people in the Sangha who were supposed to be, you know, peaceful Buddhists who would have killed him if they caught him. Um, and there's there's more about that later in the sutra, which is kind of fascinating, the politics of the Sangha, but um, not my th subject for tonight. So um, here's uh, what uh, Hui Neng reporting on his meeting on his transmission with Hung Yen and where the Diamond Sutra comes up again. In the third watch of the night, I went to the fifth patriarch's room. Using the robe as a screen, he, to hide out, he expounded the Diamond Sutra to me. When he came to the sentence, one should use one's mind in such a way that it will be free from any attachment, I at once became thoroughly enlightened and realized that all things in the universe are the essence of mind itself. That's a pretty great section. Um, and I love that statement. Again, one should use one's mind in such a way that it will be free from any attachment. And very similar to what uh, Hung Yen said to Shen Xiu, uh, that um, from thought moment to thought moment, one should be able to realize the essence of mind all the time. 
the way that the essence of mind is realized is that it is kept free from attachment so that one can actually realize it instead of all the objects that it's busy clinging to. So it's kind of a nice uh, definition of enlightenment in a way that if your mind, to have your mind free of delusion so that you can realize the nature of the mind, you have to withdraw those attachments. And that's why clinging creates delusion and you're not able to realize your true nature. So I really like the way all that kind of works. So then uh, Hui Neng in his awakening has this wonderful pronouncement, which has a lot uh, more in it to contemplate. As he has this realization, he says, who would have thought that the essence of mind is intrinsically pure? Who would have thought that the essence of mind is intrinsically free from becoming or annihilation? Who would have thought that the essence of mind is intrinsically self-sufficient? Who would have thought that the essence of mind is intrinsically careful? Brace yourself. Free from change. We'll talk about that later. Uh, who would have thought that all things are the manifestation of the essence of mind? Knowing that I had realized the essence of mind, it's hard not to know that after he said all that. The patriarch said, for him who does not know his own mind, careful again, there is no use learning Buddhism. <laughs> That's a little harsh. On the other hand, if he knows his own mind and sees intuitively his own nature, he is a Buddha. So there you go. Now here's an alternate translation of this particular little part of Hui Neng's transmission. The patriarch secretly explained the Diamond Sutra to Hui Neng, and when Hui Neng heard the phrase, one should activate one's mind so it has no attachment, he was suddenly and completely enlightened and understood that all things exist in self-nature. So that's a little bit of a different emphasis, but I also like that translation that's in the quotes, one should activate one's mind so it has no attachment. Another way of looking at uh, one should use one's mind in such a way that it will be free from any attachment. So those, I like to cross-reference those translations. They have interesting hints in the way that they're translated. So now we'll take a few quotes from the Diamond Sutra that speak to this uh, non-attachment of the essential nature of the mind, what they're calling in the Platform Sutra, the essence of mind, which really adds up to true nature, true nature of the mind, true nature of the self. Most honored one, I have a question to ask you. If sons and daughters of good families want to develop the highest, most fulfilled and awakened mind, if they wish to attain the highest perfect wisdom, what should they do to help quiet their drifting minds and help subdue their craving thoughts? And this is a translation that's uh, by Alex Johnson. It's a modern translation, but I came across it and I liked it. Those who follow what I'm about to say here will be able to subdue their discriminative thoughts and craving desires. It's possible to attain perfect tranquility and clarity of mind by absorbing and dwelling on the teaching I'm about to give. So he's saying this is the uh, Rajna Paramita. This is the highest uh, wisdom teaching that he's about to give. So here's, here's, a, here's a, a quote. Oh, no, this is a continuation. Furthermore, Sabuti, in the practice of compassion and charity. Oh, did I lose my place? No. This is, so I'm skipping a little. Furthermore, Sabuti, in the practice of compassion and charity, a disciple should be detached. That is to say, he should practice compassion and charity without regard to appearances, without regard to form, without regard to sound, smell, taste, touch, or any quality of any kind. Subhuti, this is how the disciples should practice compassion and charity. He's suggesting here, sort of partially my other theme of practicing without attachment, but the part of it that echoes this unattachment, this unattached nature of the mind is that he should do so without regard to appearances, without regard to form, without regard to sound, smell, taste, touch, or any quality of any kind. Okay. So now next in chapter 10, he says, a disciple should develop a mind which is in no way dependent upon sights, sounds, smells, tastes, 
sensory sensations, or any mental conceptions. A disciple should develop a mind which does not rely on anything. And you can see that that is echoing the way that it was interpreted in the Chinese um, by Huineng in the Platform Sutra. Now, this is a very similar statement from a slightly different angle and slightly different translation. But I really like that statement. That's kind of the essence of that theme in the Diamond Sutra. A disciple should develop a mind which is in no way dependent upon sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensory sensations, or any mental conceptions. A disciple should develop a mind which does not rely on anything. This also reminds me of uh, a quote that I recently uh, used somewhere else from Song San, where he said that once you've discovered that you know, that level of the mind, that's the nature of the mind that's not dependent on any outside phenomena. <laughs> Song Sang was a little dramatic and said that if a nuclear bomb went off and blew up everything to pieces, it wouldn't have any effect on this mind. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of like an extreme highlighting of what's being said here, that uh, a disciple should develop a mind which is in no way dependent upon sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensory sensations, or any mental conceptions. A disciple should develop a mind which does not rely on anything. So I think that statement in chapter 10 is the essence of everything. Therefore, Subhuti, the minds of all disciples should be purified of all thoughts that relate to seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, and discrimination. They should use their minds spontaneously and naturally without being constrained by preconceived notions arising from the, sen arising from the senses. So there's a really strong statement here. I don't know if people notice this or if they accept it or if they think it's okay, but it's basically saying that whatever you are... Uh, whatever information you're receiving through the senses or through thought, you should basically essentially detach from all that. And instead, your mind should be coming from its own nature to act spontaneously, uh, not based on its evaluation of sights and sounds and, and uh, conceptions. Now, if that sounds kind of extreme, let's compare it to the Heart Sutra, which we chant all the time. Therefore, in emptiness, no form, no feelings, perceptions, impulses, consciousness, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no color, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no object of mind, no realm of eyes, and so forth until no realm of mind consciousness. This sounds kind of similar, not being dependent on the aspect of the mind that is getting its information through the through thought and senses. And of course, these are both part of the Prajnaparamita Sutra group and are dealing with similar themes. So they say some related uh, statements. So here's some more uh, material on this from the Diamond Sutra, from chapter 14. Therefore, Subhuti, disciples should leave behind all distinctions of phenomena and awaken the thought of the attainment of supreme enlightenment. A disciple should do this by not allowing the their mind to depend upon ideas evoked by the world of the senses, by not allowing their mind to depend upon ideas stirred by sounds, odors, flavors, sensory touch, or any other qualities. The disciple's mind should be kept independent of any thoughts that might arise within it. If the disciple's mind depends upon anything in the sensory realm, it will have no solid foundation in any reality. This is why Buddha teaches that the mind of a disciple should not accept the appearances of things as a basis when exercising charity. Subhuti, uh, as disciples practice compassion and charity for the welfare of all living beings, they should do it without relying on appearances and without attachment. Just as the Buddha declares that form is not form, hello, so he also declares that all living beings are in fact not living beings. Pleased to meet you. Um, and then finally, from chapter 31, Subhuti, when people begin their practice of seeking to attain total enlightenment, they ought to see, to perceive, to know, to understand, and to realize 
that all things and all spiritual truths are no things. And therefore, they ought not to conceive within their minds any arbitrary conceptions whatsoever. So in a way, you can say that all of those statements throughout the Diamond Sutra are commentaries on that statement in chapter 10, which I think is very worthy of contemplation. A disciple should develop a mind which is in no way dependent upon sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensory sensations, or any mental conceptions. A disciple should develop a mind which does not rely on anything. So there's a sense in which we can look at that in our practice. What are we depending on? What kind of conceptions and beliefs and ideas are we depending on? How do we interpret what we see and what we hear and turn those into ideas about reality? And what is it like to withdraw our attachment to those things? It doesn't mean that we stop seeing or hearing or we stop thinking. Um, and in one of the quotes, he says that, you know, it's not that he doesn't say stop thinking. And in, and Hui Neng says in part of the Platform Sutra, he says, you know, there are these guys who have been working on stopping thought. We don't talk to them anymore. <laughs> Because they're creating a state of pacification where it's not that they're developing discriminative wisdom or, you know, or high, uh, high prajna, but instead they're just suppressing thought. And that's not really the way. All that does is turn you into a non-active, uh, into a non-active passive state. So what he does say in the Diamond Sutra, though, is he says that you should not be dependent on any thoughts that arise within the mind. So you're not busy trying to take your hammer and stomp down the thoughts and get rid of them. You're trying to look at them as thoughts and not being attached. So if the idea arises in your mind, oh, I should do this or I should do that, or I shouldn't have done this or I shouldn't have done that, or this is right and this is wrong, or, you know, why did I do this? Or, why didn't I do that? All of the all of the uh, kind of samsaric uh, conceptions and ideas that lead to constant dukkha, constant suffering. Uh, those thoughts arise in the mind. You know, one just doesn't attach to them. You don't cling to them, and you don't depend on them. So, if you can do the same thing with the thoughts that arise in your own mind, you can do the same thing. They get deflated when you don't pay attention to them or fight with them. And it's like, oh, I wish I hadn't have said that. And that person thinks this of me and all of these delusory thoughts that have nothing to do with anything and that deal with the past and the future. If you can just go, oh, there's another thought. Okay. Now the Diamond Sutra has told me and Hui Nang emphasized that I shouldn't rely on those ideas. I shouldn't rely on those thoughts. And if I see something and it bothers me, you know, because I have a certain reaction to it, I shouldn't rely or be attached to that reaction either. Just let it go. Now, it may sound a little bit simple, but the idea of withdrawing or clinging and attachment to external objects and to delusory ideas is not a bad one. And so I encourage uh, taking a look at those statements in the Diamond Sutra and in the Platform Sutra. I think they can be helpful for finding a place of peace somewhere in the middle of all that. Happy Samsara, everybody. <laughs>